Hello everyone, today we talk about the Metharan e Tablu u Alem, that is the greater drum and standard orchestra of the medieval Ottoman army. This is a relatively famous topic, inasmuch as the Ottomans provided themselves since the foundation of their dynasty, as we will see now, not very differently actually from other Islamic rulers, but still with a greater tradition and swing of such a military band that in fact would always accompany um, the uh, Ottoman armies until the 19th century when it was actually destroyed together with the Janissaries and unfortunately as a consequence with great part of what could be the understanding of this musical uh, tradition that surely had some legacy as we will see now the Ottoman military bands and I made a video three years ago about the Tabl Kana or Nakara Kana that we will explain later um, on the also on the entire essentially world um, military uh, music, musical instruments, right uh, essentially great part of the um, the military bands as you see them, the, the type of music instruments and other symbols that remain also in our military units derive from the Ottomans. The great wars fought during the modern era brought this incredible amount of imitation. It was really double threat because the Ottomans too adopted, as you know, a big deal of Western stuff and, and vice versa, right? Um, and that uh, can be observed as a in general, not just in a military tradition, there is a lot of folk tradition, folk music in places like the, the Balkans and, and beyond that uh, bear witness of this um, uh, musical tradition that since uh, ancient times, really the Parthian times, even uh, before that, um, had uh, put uh, placed a, a strong emphasis on the transcendental uh, meaning of music. So essentially a uh, uh, a, a universal consonance that had to manifest the imperium, right? There is a lot of uh, neoplatonism about that, that in the West, for example, we, uh, you know, we, we got mostly through the, the, the Augustinian uh, tradition. Uh, our cathedrals are uh, built essentially with the same principle. Cathedrals are meant to embody pure light and music. All the Pythagorean mathematical proportions there were uh, passed down through the, the, the Platonic, Platonistic tradition and um, and beyond, right? So it was actually a much more common background than we think, except even though we have underestimated also the, uh, the Western military musical tradition since the ancient world, definitely the Middle East and, and beyond, right, also extending from it, uh, especially in, in the Golden Age of Islam to peoples like the, the Turks, uh, even the Mongols, etc., uh, had this broader uh, repercussion for, for reasons that are also strictly military, right? For example, the composition of their armies, these swarms of um, a multiple, literally, of horse archers having to be drilled into battle, uh, operating with great um, coordination that was naturally um, uh, helped uh, musically, right? And having, however, to, in this sense, manifest the, the imperium uh, in itself, the Mongols were famous in this regard, for example, being extremely silent, and we will see how this played also in, in the Ottoman uh, tradition, and playing that music. Uh, naturally, there, there is a difference between say, you know, some um, um, uh, rhythm that had to be given in the first place for carrying out specific uh, orders, and things like the Matharant that had to properly play a sort of background, kind of overall dominating uh, music, right? Uh, regarding drums, and I, I made a video about trumpets and drums, right? this kind of Apollonian tonic uh, symbolism, uh, uh, these uh, instruments used respectively for cavalry, kind of this kind of celestial heavenly immediate attack, right, flashy one, and then a drum that has this kind of Dionysian uh, trance-like, you know, uh, hypnotic effect that has to drive the infantry 
tectonic element to to hell fundamental into battle and um, ancient peoples lived dramatically within these experiences still in the middle ages right you cannot properly understand um, warfare and especially ancient warfare if you don't make the enormous effort as many anthropologists and historians make in trying to reevoke essentially what it could be Right, the broader spiritual experience that war represented multisensorially in, in a complete fashion. Right, uh, the the carnage of the Celtic um, peoples was meant there to literally have the the deity speaking right on, on the battlefield. The same goes for many other, um, you know, uh, lost obviously tradition because we're mostly oral in nature. But every single instrument in the ancient world had that specific meaning and function. You can understand really a lot of different things about those uh, military cultures, in fact, uh, through, through it. Now, today we talk mainly about, uh, I mean, the late Middle Ages. That's where Ottoman history uh, begins. Uh, we will uh, be aided by, naturally, later information from, say, the, the early modern era that can tell us something that we cannot adequately document for for the middle ages because we know the thing was there and we have kind of an overall picture telling us that this stuff was pretty normal but uh, actual documentation is in, in detail even for a power like the Ottomans in, say, the 15th century, we were, had already become significant, is scarce, right? The Islamic world is not as documented as the Western one. There are many more uncertainties, and as we will see, the main sources are actually, in fact, Western authors, also about what kind of uh, instruments uh, the Ottomans played. And naturally, even through them, we have to understand that there was uh, a, a deformity in the in the different armies. Not everything was really the same. Albeit, in this musical tradition, uh, Islam had somehow standardized the um, at least the quantity, especially of drums. The drum was really central. Right? The, the tabal, right? So the tabal khan, um, the uh, tabal. The Ottoman, in this case, the drum of the Ottoman house. So properly, the idea that the drum was like uh, an insignia of, if if not the highest insignia of military power, that was granted in a hierarchical fashion uh, within the the Muslim world to credit power. And this is exactly how, actually, the same Ottomans began their um, their their empire, right? Because the, the story goes that in the late 13th century, Ottoman, the founder of the, in fact, the Osmanian uh, dynasty, was uh, given a drum, a tug, and a sanchak by the Rum Seljuk Sultan, Allah al Din. We are in 1289 specifically. And um, Ottoman is invested with these emblems of power. Right, we will see now better the the tug, the sanjak, receiving on this occasion. By the way, the authority as a, as a bay, right? So the Turkic title for a chieftain in a honorific traditional way, and applied also with a, by this point a kind of a lineage meaning uh, specifically and being quite at this point widespread also geographically as far as Central Asia uh, and beyond also remember in a post-Mongol time and now we will observe this also as far as the the Mongol tradition was connected because the Tug there is uh, arguably connected with the same Turks since uh, quite early time but had been reinforced uh, after the Mongol conquest and and rule uh, of these areas, right? And at the ceremony of Ottoman investiture, 
at the court of the Sultan of Rum, absolute silence was insisted on during the performance of the Navba. Right? Uh, that is to say, the universal harmony, perfection, could not be disturbed on this occasion because literally the imperial power was manifested through it. Right. We know that large kettle drums known as Kuzat, we will see them now, were used uh, already in fact in the time of Ottoman the first when they were carried by elephants uh, on some occasion and they had literally a place of honor. Now, now to understand the extent of these symbols power consider that the Khorasmians uh, in the high middle ages were described having in fact the, the, the most um, developed practice of uh, the properly the drum, the table um, uh, exaltation as their uh, traditional ceremonies of power display of the rulers took place with the uh, presentation of a war chariot symbolizing naturally divine glory and the ascent to to heaven by the uh, the victorious hero and in that case the manifestation of the Saint Chorasmian power by placing a huge drum on the chariot right we're talking about this insistence on chariot warfare naturally in areas where this had been born we were talking about the high middle ages where chariot warfare did not exist anymore. And that's how deeply ingrained this concept really was. A drum that in itself embodies the hero. It's all golden, right? So the um, substance of, of the gods, not only when this show is um, displayed, all the hostages of the various subjective peoples at the Khwarezmian court had to play a, sm each, uh, a smaller drum around this chariot in an act of subordination to really however provide further power through the music to the greater power as they were obliged to. This is a beautiful traditional manifestation of properly the concept of uh, of power as we should understand in a close of it. In sense you cannot have again you cannot rule any one, you cannot have a state, you cannot have a politics, you cannot have a community if you do not have the decisive moral support of the people that are ruled, right? So this show was properly displaying this, the fact that there was an inherent reason of, in that case, Kabarezmin superiority over the peoples that uh, this power fundamentally floated on as any other existing in history at any time, right? So, um, the idea that power fundamentally manifests itself in a divine guise because the subject surrenders to the inherent superiority of the ruler, right? In any circumstance, and that's also the, the direct responsibility, the total responsibility of every single person for whatever thing happens um, in their politics. Right, so c contrary to the fourth estator nationalist and socialist bullshit that we hear today of the the poor innocent common people, these great heroes and 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 martyrs and saints that are sent to war by the evil dictators, without which the world would be just you know a beautiful place where people never die, never kill each other. Default is always an ex exclusively and completely and totally of the people for any single political action, even if their ruler sneezes. And I'm not kidding, because, again, traditional religion says this pretty out, clear, and loud. People at the time, as it would be common knowledge if we didn't live in these times, in fact, uh, instead, were way more intelligent than what we are today. Never commit the childish mistake of thinking to be kind of more capable of 
or, or, or intelligent, in fact, I don't know, than a, than a 12th century, 13th century cavalry's men, horsemen, because you just aren't, but especially you will never be, right, in your entire life. Um, so the, the, the concept of, of the drum house, the kettle drum house, the military band house, because the, the same Mataran Ib Tabla U Alem is often simply translated as the military band, but again, it derives from this greater suffix, right, matter. And so referring to the orchestra specifically, uh, and we'll see how this was composed, those in terms of the instruments that were played, and the tabla, Alem, that is a, the, the drum and standard, right? So, not just a musical instrument, but the symbol of power, and uh, annexed to it, right? Which, in the ceremony of Ottoman investiture at the Sultanate of Rome's court, of course, was represented by the tug and the sanjak, right? We have we made. A significant amount of Ottoman and broader Turkic and Mongol warfare videos, so more or less you're, you're acquainted to it. The, the tug um, is essentially a pole with a circularly arranged horse or yak tail hairs. It could vary in color, um, uh, arranged at the top, right? Down. And it was historically flown by Turkic tribes such as the Tugluk Confederation also during the period of the Mongol Empire, right? And in this time, we are at the end of the 13th century. So in a moment of prevalence in, in the Middle East, of course, of Turkic Mongol Khanates, um, it was essentially now the, the standard symbol of power used, in fact, by, by the Ottoman Empire, right? Uh, that, as you know, had could boast at least dynastically some kind of older origins. Today, we do not actually um, uh, digress on this, but the Tug, you know, uh, became, in the modern age, because of the wars against the Ottomans, also a sort of symbol of prey and imitation uh, of power, so much so that the French foreign legion famously enough, still uses it. We have seen it often also in, in Polish warfare, adopted by the Slavic cavalry of the Cossacks of the Haida Maka, under the name of Bunchuk, as it, it's known in, in the Ukrainian, in, in Polish, and which is a reflection of the original Turkic word Bunchuk. Right? In fact, it, it, it's still uh, used by some units of the Polish military um, today, just, just to say how influential it, and frightening conceptually, uh, it, it really was. Naturally, it was deeply connected with a hyper-exalted equestrian culture, so that was the, the point of it all. The yak um, for there is, is a symbol of you know, prestige, of power, of, of, of cattle raiding uh, at a lower level, but of imperial um, domination at, uh, at the same time. The sanchak instead is uh, it's mostly a term used for, naturally, the administrative divisions of the Ottoman Empire, right, that, uh, under which the Timars uh, also were, as, you know, uh, quasi-feudal uh, districts arranged, also as far as the, the, the recruitment of the Ottoman army was concerned. But the, um, the etymology of the word is Turkic. Again, Sanchak, Sanjay, can, Sinchak, it can be also spelled in, in different ways because it's transliterated naturally. Um, and it um, means, of course, district, but it, it really has an, in its origin the, the term banner or flag. Right? So when uh, these peoples normally conquered one place, one province, they fixed essentially their war banner on it, right? To so say this is the gathering point where. You know, we, we, as we are settled here now, and when we have to gather the troops again, that's the place where where we have to gather again. It's, it's a broader universal concept. It's like, you know, the Roman legionnaires fixing the labyrinth on the newly conquered land, right? And so, uh, um, a meaning of conquest, of appropriation, of, 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 of imperial um, superiority. Um, there are some Arabic equivalents like the Leva, but this is not so important now. However, the important thing 
being that um, the investor of the Ottomans as base um, was carried out by playing the Napa and providing Ottoman with a Tug and a soundtrack at the same time. And silence was enforced. Um, because the music itself was sacred and it had to be played with this meaning. Now, what were the origins of the Mether specifically? Like, as, as an orchestra, do we, we know any of this? Well, um, there are some traditions uh, in earlier Arabic sources. For example, Ibn Khaldun, right? Speaking of the Mether, right, for the Turks and the the Khorasmians, uh in uh, serving in the Caliphal armies, which is quite interesting because it shows that, despite the fact that again the the Middle East and now uh, at the time the Arabs even before this uh, Central Asian Gulams came so prevalent, um, had had a a significant musical tradition based on the drums. Again, we, we know it from from Parthian times, even even before. Um, the concept of having a somehow permanent and or professional body of military musicians to accompany the armies was um, a bigger deal, in fact, among the Turko Mongols. Again, why? Well, we said it before, right? The um, prevalence of um, cavalry warfare in such large numbers, the uh, necessity to keep these all these elements together um, with highly mobile tactics and uh, such wide um, open terrain like in the steppes, etc. had brought to the development of acoustic um, tools, right, to uh, coordinate such forces, thus uh, associating in the process a greater spiritual uh, importance to the effect of this music uh, herself, right? Consider that, again, lots of horses moving, making a hell of a noise, making the, the earth trembling, so the idea of having a greater power especially from the commander, from the source of the orders during the same battle, that would even, that could, and this was the purpose of it, all be heard over such um, uh, titanic sound, was by itself uh, the proof also of a, all a technical kind of political uh, capacity to manage such forces and this this is also the reason why of course w after the mongol conquests um, also other populations like again the ottomans we can't think of them as turks again in, in principle but again we're talking about the bosphorus we're talking about traditionally sanitary areas um that were surely you know populated with with settlers for, for those cultures etc but that are Fundamentally far from the original Central Asian uh, lifestyle, but that um, greatly um, benefited also from a political point of view, as this case of the investor really really shows, from the affirmation of more autocratic steps, models uh, uh, that uh, were in fact much more brutally. Uh, impositive, and that in in many ways, and this is a point that this is, in my opinion, evident from the prevalence of the drum as literally a, a Dionysian element. Not much of the trumpet per se, as we will see, there were likely, of course, but um, in in a way that stressed a bit, like in the relation between the Sultan and the Janissaries, like father and son, kind of master and slave, whatever, the idea of subjugation, right? The same concept of Islam itself, right? Um, and so this kind of greater bias, naturally, towards a an idea of, um, you know, of, a, of the existence of, of such 
a, a higher power that you have to consider yourself mostly just as serving it, playing it, as the uh, this, uh, the, the hostages at the Cabaretsmian court, as we were saying before, right, contributing from a tonic action, a musical instrument to such, um, you know, higher power that you can't quite even hope to, to, to achieve. That is a metaphor for God, but also for, you know, maintaining the current establishment and not kind of loading too much the, the lower elements with this kind of uh, heroic sense of themselves, it could be dangerous, and we have seen this uh, in the video that I made, for example, on Ottoman warfare regarding the Sipai, their traditional, uh, let's say, enmity slash competition with the Janissaries, um, as the the Ottomans, like any other power, feared legitimately the aristocracy as uh, po say possible competitors, even for the for the Sultanian. Uh, throne. And there is an Islam kind of a greater bias, as you know, also uh, towards any kind of earthly rulers as, as a potential usurper, right, of, of God's power. So there were some standards also um, um, ceremonially, like in the case of the same Metheran, that had to stress this. The fact that in the Imperial Palace, silence had to reign supreme. This is something in the West, for example, we didn't quite have, right? But this idea of immutable order, this was stuff actually deriving also from the Byzantine legacy. Don't get me wrong, that the Byzantines were highly, you know, crystallized as far as the palace ceremonials were concerned, even artistically, the, the older forms, the icons, the, the classicistic kind of uh, fixation, right, uh, without... Instead, how it was being resumed in the West, in the Renaissance, in a kind of more uh, even devil form. Um, so we could digress endlessly about this, but that would be a history of heart, art. And, you know, telling the truth, this is not even history of music uh, per se. But it's important to see, uh, however, which were also the instruments played by the uh, Metaran Alem, or the Metaran, if you prefer. So the Ottoman military band to pay, to make the very long story uh, short. Naturally, most of what we know comes from the later um, Ottoman military band that we know again until the 19th century. Uh, as far as I know, in Turkey, uh, in in the Turkish military, there is still a um, a thing of this kind. There are uh, kind of reenactment of these this older tradition of music, but there is a problem uh, exactly in the historical dimension of music uh, that uh, concern the fact of the reconstruction of what kind of music not just was played, but how it was played, and, and that unfortunately has been relatively lost, because what, what is being reconstructed today is somehow a hybrid, right? As far as I know, there are popular there is popular music there from World War the First, etc. But it's not quite what, unfortunately, went lost in great part in 1826. So for the Middle Ages, it's even more complicated, as you realize. Um, but we can't base ourselves on what we know, generally speaking, from the modern age. And then we will look at some sources, specifically from the 14th and the 15th century, that we are, in theory, treating uh, today for our series about late medieval uh, warfare. So the, the basic melody instrument of the band was the zurna. The zurna is a double reed shown with um, seven holes, six in front and one behind. Right. So melodically speaking, that set fundamentally the uh, the, the track. Um, and there were, by the way, there were different military bands. Right. Here we're talking about the official one. So the Sultanial band in the first place. Uh, well, this one naturally had to uh, just be over in, in uh, greater in, in size, in, in sound, in, in everything, to any other. Again, any place of Islam, from Central Africa to, uh, to, to Central Asian steppes, again, had this kind of... Tabul Khan and Akara Khan was again the, this military band which embodied 
per se just the prestige of any Islamic ruler, also competitively speaking from one another. In that video about Islamic military music, I explain all the stuff, so I will not digress once again, but it's, it's important to bear in mind that in a time like these ones, like the late Middle Ages, the early modern age, um, it, it was important for the Ottomans, um, uh, as they emerged as the greatest Islamic power, but to assert that in the first place. So it was still a matter of competition. Right, it's just like the competition that existed in the Western court, saying which was the most magnificent, whatever, all the stuff, right? So the official Ottoman, this is Sultanial band, um, uh, used uh, this large instrument known as the Kabazurna, which seems to have been actually identical to the instrument with the same name. Um, that we remember before, and that today is actually quite common in the kind of rural folklore in countries like Turkey, Bulgaria, right? Naturally, leaving a, a mark, uh, you know, in, in these in these center of kind of Ottoman of Ottoman power. There were different types of zurna evolving also over time. So that, for example, the 19th century. Uh, Ottoman music, as we know it, was um, performed by you know a, a more advanced instrument than the one used in late medieval times. And subsidiary to the zurna was the trumpet, known as boru or nether. Right. So the older borus seem to have been made of broads. However, already by the the 16th century, brass was in use. Uh, so we can guess for, for today's uh, uh, videos t chronology like there had already been some kind of hybrid there. Uh, the borrow had no holes, um, so it was like a trumpet producing uh, five notes within an ambitus of one and a half octaves. Um, and the basic percussion instrument of the matter was the tabl. Or we see or davo, as uh, as also called. That is to say, this in fact this large wooden double-headed drum uh, held uh, slantwise by a strap and beaten with two sticks of uneven dimensions and shape, thus producing the bass doom and treble tech sounds, uh, which were essential to the Ottoman conception of rhythm. Um, the Ottoman table uh, would be the, the ancestor of the folkloric drum bearing the same name uh, or tapan, kas or buband uh, as it's known in the Balkans uh, and of the same European military drum um, and uh, this distinction to say between bass treble was abandoned during the 19th century but what matters is however the the cultural influence as such. A secondary percussion instrument was the nakare, uh, from which in fact also the name nakare kind of derives as an alternative of tabulka. The nakare was a medium-sized kettle drum made of copper uh, and the two parts of the instrument were turned differently to produce the bass and treble tones and struck with sticks known as zame of uniform shape. Then there was a, a much larger kettle drum known as kus in Turkish and Persian kus, right, which um, could measure as far as one and a half meters at the top. This was also made of copper and it was the big D, as we will see now, because it's, it was the one used in battle, specifically. It was taken on campaign and also played on official occasions. It was just the, the big driver of the units, right? So really the sound that you could listen to in, in any, you know, in any part of, of the array, right? And uh, actually I had the mm, pleasure of starting a uh, battle of the late 13th century um, from uh, a source, the Steirische Reimkronik, 
that talks about the use of drums that large literally guided the army according to the uh, to the verses entirely um, so this large drum existing also however in Western Europe there was um, a German example right so well at that point uh, exactly in this years actually um, so well before the Ottomans were rising to a you know to 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 a much greater level and you know that that local instrument would have been used anyway so i presume i don't know how uh, much uh, historiography has dug in western military musical instrument it's again i specialize specifically in uh, in uh, in this you know medieval warfare in general so from a from a Western perspective, we've been mostly studying European history, and I find I did find multiple, you know, hints at musical instruments uh, on the battlefield, etc. It, it's objectively true that there is kind of the impression of these instruments being less uh, out there, and part of the reason is the documentation, what the sources wanted to write or not to write, so. I will not digress into this topic, but it's one of the, the ones I'd like really to um, to deepen better, even though I'm no expert about military music per se, because um, it seems to me that we may have easily, also comparatively to what I've seen in other aspects of warfare, like properly misunderstood a big deal of how much military music was important in battlefields, because also the, the instruments were the same, the functions were the same, you don't find much variation, uh, in this regard, um, the drum of the matter was supported by two types of brass percussion: the halilas or zils. So these are cymbals, and the chavgan, that is instead a, a crescent-shaped jingle rattle with with bells, which was also typical of the steps. Uh, normally, st steps horses were. Uh, you know, going barded with this bells attached on them so that they had to, to ring. Uh, as much as also that there were other banners with these rings and so on, they, they were meant to naturally um, transmit in a kind of transcendental way that kind of divine order, um, divine force agitating within such a heavenly animal as the horse as much as could be tonic as well in the point of conjunction between uh, heaven and, and earth right and so as much for, for the banners as well and so such celestial music had to somehow spur further like had to, to render aware creating a, a sort of even a screen around the horse just in, in, in the horseman with, through the, the manifestation of power uh, ipso facto now, what kind of music was played concretely? I, I will say a few here, because it, it also becomes complex, because it's mixed with other... We, we don't know so well, but it, there are many other connections where not just military. So, um, the repertoire was named, was known as Nevbet or Fajil. Right. Um, we have just, like from also later time, six pieces survive uh, survive um, the, the 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 repertoire we know about was connected properly with with the Ottoman court music so we know also less about uh, the other bands of course um, the nominant forms were no uh, were the ones known as Peshrev or the semi uh, the improvised taxim as well um, the first two were uh, two separate genres for uh, the meter form which had somehow simpler rhythmic cycles and melodic leaps than what we knew uh, the in fact the Ottoman court music would have become in the contemporary era so things naturally change over time we wouldn't play always the same music that this changed uh, in ways also that are difficult to, to reconstruct um, again, and the one performance practice associated exclusively with the meter was the so-known karabatak, 
which uh, you can spot here immediately an onomatopoeic uh, kind of um, kind of harsh and kind of uh, in fact cracking almost uh, uh, you know fire right from 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 a battlefield uh, scenario right in fact this uh, performance alternated soft passages with uh, thunderous ones um, likely uh, simulating the, the timing of kind of uh, like the, the different in intensity of combat right with some kind of broader orderly maneuvers movements confrontations and then the actual units crashing into one another right and what is fascinating is that the meta repertoire uh, for what we uh, again has survived we can see uh, is identified uh, in the same sources by the names of individual it items that are quite eloquent that is for example the same sanjak standard right so referring to political territorial power the atlu referring to the horsemen the ally dudzen that is the par parade order right so some and the lc so the ambassador something ceremonial in nature there is also the rb that however is the probably the martial um repertoire uh instead so you understand that this band uh played essentially in many circumstances we will see it now um, still having to express fundamentally the universal power of the Ottoman sultans, right? So the, the most important, uh, as we've seen, method was the one of, of the Sultanial court, in fact, uh, as it was part of the palace service. What is also fascinating and reminiscent of that thing we said before about the Kvaretsmans and the same practice uh, for, for what you know consisted in is that the musicians of the Meteran uh, were, right, at least at, at this point in history, originally of the Dev Shirme. In other words, these were the same uh, troops as military musicians that had been uh, levied from mostly the, the subjected provinces, mostly the Balkans, as you know, Albanians, Serbians, etc., to make up the Janissary Corps. As such, they were trained in the palace school of music once they were selected for becoming military musicians. Um, and interestingly enough, we do have names of some composers, at least from slightly later times, the 16th, the 17th century, such as respectively uh, Nefiri Beran, Zurna Zanbashi, Ibrahim Aga, right? Um, so it appears that um, the task of these uh, players was just as with the Janissaries, the method, Itablu Alem, was um, connected with a private Sultanial dynastic imperial power, right? That had to embody the, in fact, uh, the 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 same power deriving from the subject elements and the ones mostly, in fact, um, slavishly connected with the ruler. Again, like the the Janissaries that were essentially the sultanial army as opposed to the feudal one that were conceived properly in this state of, of constant subordination, properly as servants of the great masters and adoptive children, and so this kind of almost redemptional sense. If you've seen, for example, the entire Janissary symbology was very material, very um, ketonic, very uh, kind of Dionysian um, in many ways, as they were called, for example, with the name of Literally, the the, sur the 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 surfly mansions, right? The handed symbols, even at the great cauldron, the there was the sense of being literally a function, an element just of the 
a sultanial um, staff, right? It had to serve him uh, in this regard. Thus, music was likely conceived in this fashion because it was literally the sultan that ruled the empire, right? Uh, this era is before the nation state and what people like to think of uh, countries in the past where it's essentially a personal prestige to simply um, uh, attract power from from God and consequently as a medium from from earth right and you uh, you are the one who this 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 music is played for in a sense and embodying the same power um, there were other matters forming um, part of the urban musicians guilds of Constantinople right these Matter received no salary, but the for performed at public and private festivities. So, just like in the West, you had, of course, in this case, the capital of the Ottoman Empire this is more of a capital than in other countries, of course. But that fundamentally compete right for providing, uh, like for, for captivating the, the the Sultan's favor, right, and playing on these occasions and kind of expressing a bit like the the mood of of the city. Uh, itself, right? So, of course, other bands existed, right? What mattered for the Ottoman army, naturally, was the sultanial presence um, and uh, and or by, you know, the one of the Grand Vizier, depending. I don't know how the thing evolved exactly. In later times, we can make other videos, but uh, the uh, the music was kind of the, the manifestation of, of the power itself, was, as we've seen, also just a mechanic mean to, to order the army in the first place. Thus, it um, it had to be there in any major campaign, right? And we can think, naturally, that the the various um, uh, governors, Timarios, etc., had something just on their own. I mean, musicians were present in all uh, units that had just to maintain... Uh, the, the formation that had to, to give the rhythm of, of the march and all these things. So surely there was also a competition in this regard that was surely something a bit more structured than what we see in the West and that indeed the the, the, the same Westerners were in fact uh, quite impressioned by by just adopting most of the same instruments and in practice about, with a different meaning um, in during during these centuries. Um, so the sultanial official matter had three distinct functions we could already grasp from some of the composition title. So the matter first of all was a military band. So the main task was playing continuously during battle. It's as if, if you had by stopping that, right, you would have stopped the entire army from fighting. It's as if this music was pouring constant divine power through the sultan into the the forces, right? And that's why it was specifically the sultans, because if, according to tradition, of course, is if this commander had not been adequate for his role, uh, also the the this uh, this function would have not been properly performed, and the order of the army would have, would have collapsed. Uh, the standard, the alem, so that, uh, as we've seen, was attached specifically to the band from the name Tabla Alem, and that was fundamental, again, as the same insignia of power was located near the matter. In fact, so that uh, silence from the direction of the matter could lead even properly to the Janissaries uh, abandoning the field because it meant that the Sultan had fled, right? The matter would have given properly uh, percussion signals uh, to mm, carry out certain orders, 
right then. Uh, for example, it was the tabla e asaish, that is the drum of repose when fighting had to stop. The Janissaries entered battle at the pace of the Mather music. Um, and importantly enough, this music was not, however, responsible for regulating the troops outside of, of the battle. Right? The march, as such, was not part of the Mather genre. Right? So other bands played that. But the Mather was connected properly with the struggle with combat, right, and with properly major battles. As such, where like, the Sultanial army had to, to, to go into. Then there was a palace ceremonial, which entailed, for example, the Mather performing, um, accompanied by prayers for the ruler and the state, every afternoon, when the Sultan was greeted. In the course of Ottoman history, this ceremony became ever more regulated, ritualized, right? Uh, the vizier, the provincial governors, and vassal rulers would grow to have their own matter proper, right? Um, this is the case, for example, for the Khans of Crimea and the voivodes of Moldavia, which is interesting because the latter were Christians, right? So the spread, as we've seen, even as far as Poland, uh, some, you know, uh, symbols of power coming from the steppe and from these other non-Christian cultures was, was normal, right? And the, the, these lesser matters were called tabla al uh, ulem shahibi that is to say the uh, the drum and standard of possession right that was in fact granted um, by the Ottoman Sultan just as this had been granted by back in the day a higher authority such as the Sultan of Rum where the uh, Osmanians were not even uh, through which they, they became base in, in the first places they yet weren't. Thus, throughout the modern age, this is typical, there was a, a ceremonial was structured accordingly, a hierarchy that was, you know, laid out more extensively as with the consolidation properly of the Ottoman state, it, its modernization. Originally, however, as you understand, it was a much more ancestral, personal kind of um, primitive and especially um, properly holy warlike concept of, of power. Then there was another uh, function the matter performed every morning and night from a tower within the garden of the Top Kapi Palace. This had the function of transmitting the music from other towers in the capital and in many other cities of the empire. So such a sort of um, power emanation to the furthermost borders of the empire. This specific matter performance occurred before the morning prayer the Shabba Namazi and after the night prayer the Isha Namazi naturally to maintain the um, synchrony uh, there was just a general uh, ceremony being held um, wherever in the in the empire so that, that they wouldn't quite listen to the you know they wouldn't wait for for the top copy tower to to, to play just to, to repeat it afterwards because otherwise it would have taken a long time to reach all the boards. They would just do it together with the prayers. Thus, you know, in a way for which the empire had to resonate with this imperial sound. Now, as far as the late medieval sources are specifically concerned, we have uh, essentially just 15th century ones that that I know of indicating uh, the composition of the matter. 
such in the instruments specifically. For example, Konstantin Mihailovich records his principal constituent as quote, four great drums, one camel carrying two, and another the other two. Here, surely there is some kind of uh, numerical symbology, essentially the one having two and the other uh, two having one, right? And so a sort of emanatistic power of the kind we, hit, we just described for how the method was performed. Um, these drums are the aforementioned pretty big one cuz, right, and as we've seen the hand, the specific function of being beaten only uh, in, in a great battle, right, to, 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 to fight a great battle. To fight a great battle. Accordingly, there was a multitude of other drums, great and small, according to Mihailovich. So again, this still, uh, this music is still reflecting uh, down, like to create, first of all, uh, more noise, but also symbolizing exactly, and perhaps in fact other um, other units, at least you know, uh, mm, modulating the overall orders in a more uh, complex way, right, uh, that would have been used to issue specific orders uh, and so on. Unfortunately, how this mechanism worked, we, we don't know, right, in, in detail, but we can expect, um, in a sense. We know that at the Battle of Terzan in 1473, Murad Paleologus uh, attack was led by, quote, cattle drummers and other martial instruments. Um, again, think the idea of even leading an attack with a drum, right? This would have been mostly suited for, for infantry, right? The Ottoman army, generally speaking, was uh, very good at cavalry, but the majority of its forces were uh, becoming, uh, throughout this time, ever more uh, on foot, this... This doesn't mean, as we've seen, just, just in this step they wouldn't use drums otherwise, but there was this concept, again, that um, uh, the even the attack should should be played as a sort of kind of Dionysian trance to send gradually forward kind of units into into the meat grinder rather than playing as kind of more more complexly attack um, kind of um, uh, kind of more surgical attacks uh, way, which probably were instead accompanied by by trumpets, right? And this, I think, was especially the case of the Timariot troops, the Sipais, and so these forces were traditionally free. Uh, and that it's possible that the Sultanial um, army would would obscure in, in the process. Because it was central, and those had just to obey. At the Battle of Outlook Belly, quote, both sides. Uh, this was this. These were battles fought between uh, the Ottomans and the Alkoyonlu, right? So we have seen the, the white ship Turks, uh, the black ship Turks, made also videos about their army organization. So they were somehow similar with one another. The, the latter Turks being more. Persian influence, but fundamentally, as we've seen, having received this older tradition, musical tradition from both the, the Arabo-Persian and Turco-Mongolian uh, background, who said, but both sides sounded a countless number of knackers, drums, and other warlike instruments, the noise and ding being so great that one had to hear it to believe it. Again, remember these bands had to sound louder than an entire army moving, louder than cannons, and to be neatly uh, distinguished in the orders that were carried, carried through that. In 1453, Tetaldi writes that the Ottomans, quote, have hardly any trumpets, hardly, right, so there were, of course, um, using instead mainly drums and other instruments, this again could be the case, but for 1453 is naturally the siege 
of Constantinople. So um, there was, a, there was a, a very large infantry force, right? Also of other subjected peoples and beyond. So that kind of more chthonic dimension may have been more symbolically um, relevant, probably the idea of even subjugating the same Constantinople at the sound of the the same serfs of the Sultan, right? So something that stood even uh, under that. Other sources, however, do mention trumpets. For example, Calcocondylus records them together with pipes and cymbals. Barbaro, on the other hand, refers constantly only to quote castanets and tambourines. Again. Um, we don't know. Naturally, these sources are uh, different. Some here, you understand, are Slavic, some are Italians, some are Greeks. Uh, so they, they had all a different background to, to describe this, this stuff. However, the general picture that emerges is the prevalence of the drum. However, and I, I, as I uploaded the picture here, there is... Um, um, a print from Breidenbach uh, Peregrinationes of 1486. This is a German source. Um, uh, the, the showing, right, the drawings of uh, drummers and trumpeters, right? By again, this is a Western artist uh, realizing them. So we don't know how you know accurate to 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 the ultimate detail this was, but it's pretty um, you know it's somehow reliable. And uh, that does show, in fact, uh, trumpets as well, that, again, would have been necessary, because the Apollonian uh, sprint like that, especially uh, heavy cavalry, before a charge must, must have, is just in military history connected with the trumpets, and so just striking the tympan and, and immediately just getting that flashy kind of thunder blitz um, uh, type of attack. And we've seen that uh, the, uh, the the traditional um, performance associated with with the matter specifically was the uh, the karabatak, which did have this alternation between a more kind of again uh, melody and then some kind of crushing thundering. Uh, sound which um, had to evidently imitate the the alternation of combined arm tactics and so uh, just a single instrument w alone would have not uh, done um, and I can't stress how the two things how strictly connected the two things were in any case the drums were prevalent as well so consider that when you consider also, how the Ottoman army was led, in which perspective, again, this kind of sort of um, servitude, uh, especially as far as the sultanial element, the core of the army was was uh, concerned. Right. Naturally, today we just carved this parenthesis about the Ottoman musicians and specifically the Mehran Itab Alem. However, you know the Ottoman army was composed by so many different uh, troops, by background, culture, religion, and so on. It, uh, you can make the case that aside from the obvious intersections and hybrid and, and, and synthesis and so on, um, there were some of the most different types of musical traditions within the army itself. Uh, it's the comprehensive role of all of them in this as much as in, in the hierarchy of, of the army that made also the effect on the field. And witnessing that must have been really, you know, spectacular uh, in many ways, because battles are spectacular, um, in, uh, whether one likes it uh, or, or not. Um, however, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe 
to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content for uh, today as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye